Thank you for the kind introduction. By the way, uh, Jim and I, you might have heard this before, uh, we both are graduates of Bozeman Senior High School in Bozeman, Montana. Jim was the uh, class president in 1972, and I was the uh, president in 1979. So uh, we both share uh, Bozeman Hawk heritage. Go Hawks! Politically <laughs> <laughs> correct time to yell, Go Hawks! You know, right? I, I, I reminded, and it just as uh, John mentioned, my DNA and my band come from the private sector. I, uh, that first election that I uh, I won after being student body president both in high school was U.S. Congress. So I, I did not serve in a legislature. I did not uh, serve in any elected capacity. I spent 28 years in the private sector. I'm the only chemical engineer in Congress, so I hold down the gate caucus as well. <laughs> but I spent 13 years at Procter & Gamble, 12 years in the cloud computing business, getting a company startup, taking it public. Uh, building a global company. But um, you know, as I think about cybersecurity, my, my bent is certainly on the side of, uh, I think at the end of the day, the private sector will have a whole lot more to offer on this issue than the federal government. Uh, there's clearly a partnership here, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, by the time the federal government figures out what to do on cyber, the bad guys are probably already four years ahead of us. And I'd say there's certainly a cadence and speed in the private sector that will eventually, that they'll be the winners in this battle, but there is a role for the federal government as too, clearly. It reminds me about the three little boys who were out bragging on the playground here in Washington, D.C. recently. In fact, two little boys had just moved here from Montana. One little boy was a Washington, D.C. native. And the first little boy from Montana who just moved to Washington, D.C., was bragging about how fast his dad was. He said, my dad's so fast, he's a boat hunter, that he can launch his arrow at a target and then run to the target and he beats it. <laughs> Second little boy said, well, that's nothing. He says, uh, my dad uh, hunts elk in Montana and uh, he goes out to the range and he practices with his uh, 300 wind mag and he can squeeze that trigger and run to the target. He beats the bullet to the target. The third little boy, who'd grown up in Washington, D.C., said, uh, well, that's nothing. He said, my dad's a federal bureaucrat and works in Washington, D.C. He leaves the office every day at 5 o'clock. He's home by 4.30. Having spent a lot of time in the run-and-go world of cloud computing, starting a business, where your competitive advantage is you can run faster than your competition. Speed is what wins in that space. You ask yourself, what kept, what kept us up at night? What would, uh, other than hitting your uh, revenue targets every quarter? By the way, I did an off-the-record uh, interview with Fox when I first came to, to the Senate. I said, what's the biggest change from coming to, to up here in the, the public sector? I says, you know, to be honest, it's the first time in 28 years I have not been held accountable for a quarterly result. <laughs> <laughs> so we keep you up at night would be certainly hitting your targets for Wall Street and so forth. Your, your, your goals there is you have got to keep a step ahead here to keep uh, 1,100 employees with, uh, with checks. But I'll tell you what else kept us up at night was being on the front page of the Wall Street Journal of the New York Times because of a, of a cyber attack or a, or a breach of our data. Uh, we hosted uh, Fortune 500 companies, some of the biggest names that uh, you know. We actually had some presence with the federal government, a small percent of our revenues, but we, we hosted some very important federal agencies, so we were always a source of attack. Uh, Jimmy Romney, the CEO of IBM recently said, cybercrime is the greatest threat to every company in the world. This is coming from the CEO of IBM. It's been said there are two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that know they've been hacked. There have been a lot of breaches. If certainly we, we watched what happened 2013, the, in the middle of the uh, the e-retail season with Target, uh, their net income dropped 46 percent following the breach. They took a hit of market cap for a while. The stock eventually bounced back. Verizon just closed on that deal with Yahoo. It's been estimated that Verizon was able to uh, cut 350 million dollars off the price of Yahoo, primarily because of the breach 
that happened at Yahoo. Cybercrime is the fastest growing crime in the United States. The global cost estimated this year is $3 trillion. It is estimated to be $6 trillion by 2021. Online users today. There are about 2 billion people today around the world that are online. Microsoft projects that will double to 4 billion by the year 2021, which is not that far away. Last month, you saw the ransomware attack that hit over 100 countries. As we had chatted about that, and engaged some of our best, uh, Secretary Kelly at Homeland Security, even Secretary Battis, Department of Defense, we're thankful that because of rapid response, we were able to contain that threat. And frankly, there was a little problem in the malware that uh, the person who created that didn't think about. And we had a, a quick thinking vision that bought a domain name quickly, probably on GoDaddy or something, and put it in play and actually stopped that. But it, it hit over 100 countries. It even penetrated England's health services. And speaking of government breaches, you can all remember the famous OPM breach. Now, I spent, as I mentioned, 28 years in business outside this town, outside of government. And I'd never received a letter from the HR department saying that my data had been breached until I became a federal employee. <laughs> I remember doing an interview with Neil Cavuto, and I brought the little letter with me. How many of you received that letter, by the way? Yeah, I mean, you ask that question here in the swamp of D.C. about, you know, most folks will raise their hand. And it's remarkable. And that's why I always have a little bit of a chagrin. I kind of chuckle when, you know, Congress roars up and thinks, we've got the answers. Or I should say the federal government has the answers to this problem. I say, well, uh, they've got an answer, but I'm not sure it's ever going to be the answer. These breaches have some national security impacts. We saw what happened with that OPM breach where our adversaries were able to cross-reference the data set, and they could see, now, why are these people here on, on this list? But there's five people right now serving at the embassy in some unnamed country that aren't on the normal OPM HR list, which they probably say to themselves, well, that means they must be working for a different agency, perhaps, under the umbrella of being over here as part of the embassy staff. So what compromised our intelligence community significantly? So this is, this is a very serious issue. And um, uh, one part of, there's many possible solutions, but something that uh, we've been working on, as uh, John mentioned, this Rapid Innovation Act, it requires the Undersecretary for Science and Technology to support cybersecurity research, development, testing, evaluation, and transition to coordinate those activities with the other, other federal agencies. I mean, we, we have a big enough problem in this town as it is just getting the House to talk to the Senate. I was on the floor of the House yesterday, uh, walked over there, and I, you know, I served uh, two years in the House, and now I've been two and a half years in the Senate, back when I was elected uh, to the Senate. I was the at-large member prior to that for Montana. So you're one of one, and John Cornyn said to me, Steve, you know, this is a big step down. You went from being one of one uh, to being one of two, and I thought, you know, you're probably right. <laughs> you're over there in the house, and you're the Montana guy, you know, you're, you're it. And uh, over in the Senate, you've got to share that responsibility. But I was over there with our newly elected uh, Congressman Rachel and Forte, and it just, it just reminded me again as I was engaging with some of my colleagues that I served with in the House, some of the chairs and some of the committees, they were quick to come over and just huddle, like, what's going on in the Senate? And I was, you know, giving some pretty basic information. And you would think that was somebody from Kyrgyzstan or something. <laughs> and they just walk, you know, a couple hundred yards down the second floor of the Capitol, and you're in this other chamber that the Founding Fathers dreamed about, this bicameral body that we have. But uh, it's just as the nature sometimes of, of, uh, of what we have in Washington. And it gets, as you know, far worse when you start breaking it into federal agencies and the lack of courteous communication. So this would reauthorize the secretary to conduct some more pilot programs and do that over a four-year period versus year by year. If there's a problem in this town, it's uncertainty. And put some certainty uh, would certainly be a step in the right direction. Lastly, it'll be bringing Silicon Valley's know-how. By the way, it's not just Silicon Valley. There's a lot of valleys around this country now that have a world-class 
the technology company. So we're one of them. Our, we built our company an hour away uh, from Yellowstone National Park, 20 minutes away from the same river that Brad Pitt was fishing on with uh, Robert <laughs> Murray, uh, the Gallup River, that a river runs through it, being famous. I uh, will tell you, I was fly fishing in Montana before Brad Pitt ruined it for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when you were able to build a technology company in the quality of life that's second to none, you can attract and retrain the best talent in the world. And so that's why it's not just Silicon Valley, it's just say American innovation will play a very important role in work with the federal government. Um, and lastly, if you remember Mike Mansfield, the longest serving majority leader in the history of the United States Senate in Montana. Uh, Mike Mansfield had a very uh, famous line that he would say, uh, besides saying, yep. Yeah. And I have that, in fact, I have a map, a little wood uh, outline of Montana, also says, yep, on in honor of Mike Mansfield. Uh, but something else he used to say was tapper light. And I think that's good advice for those of us who have been given responsibilities and the honor of serving in Congress. We have an important problem here with cyber, but the answer is going to be, I think, coming from federal and, and private sector working together, and that we should have the humility to tap our light, uh, because I think that the primary answers here are going to be found outside this town, not inside this town. Thanks much. You bet. Yeah. But, John Timmons, do you have a question for him? And if not, Tom Taki, do you have a, uh, one great question that he could answer? Either either of you. Well, I will, of course, defer to oh, yeah. oh. Mr. Taki. <laughs> so you indicated that uh, you thought that the private sector would be able to address this issue. Yeah. It seems like it's been with us quite a while, and I don't see that the private sector is yet accomplishing that objective. <clears throat> What do you? What gives you confidence that yeah. the private sector is going to address the issue and in what time frame? Yeah. So there's. A, I will say this, and, and as I said, it's, it's not the answer. Um, that's why there is going to be. I think there's room for legislation to work together on it. But uh, I tell you, if you um, one, there is incredible built-in accountability uh, for companies to defend the PII of. of it's, 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 the, it's the crown jewels of a company, and the penalties are so severe. Just the, the marketplace inflicts incredible penalties, whether it's an earnings loss or a market cap loss, if there's ever a compromise in, in data. So I, I would argue there's some pretty built-in accountability. And it, it, it's, have you ever watched FlightAware before on your phone to see all those planes in the air? And you look at it, you say, isn't it amazing how many planes fly every day? Just looking at the, the, the radar map of this country, and, and virtually without incident, but there's an incident every once in a while, but there are a lot of planes flying every day without incident. If you look at literally the millions of attacks every day, every company is facing, I'm not talking about tens, and I'm talking millions of attacks daily. In fact, millions of attacks hourly is the size of this and they are able to defend their data uh, 24 by 7 most of the time, but we hear about the Yahoo's and the targets. Just like if a plane goes down, we know we're very safe on an airplane, but they occasionally crash and we find out why. So um, I, I guess that's why I think ultimately um, they're going to be a step ahead and move fast in the federal government. Now, here's something we could, we've been talking about, can we quantify some kind of a score, like your FICA score? Um, you know, if you can get your credit rating, you can, you can quantify how, how good your credit rating is. Would there be some way to, to bring additional accountability here for the private sector that would say there's certain best practices that would even need to be followed, need to be shared, and to quantify some kind of a threat level or risk assessment there with, with the company? We're playing around that idea. Um, and, and, and lastly, the ability to quickly share data from the from the private sector and the public sector with our best, our smartest folks uh, who work behind closed doors, behind uh, tight firewalls. Um, how do we incentivize companies to be more open with the federal government? And conversely, the federal government be more, more open with, with companies here to share that data. I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Right. Senator, thank, thank you. you very much. Roy, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's great to be here, uh, back here in front of this group. This is really, uh, you know, I've been in Congress uh, starting my second term, so I'm in the third year, and uh, I'm really 
come to value the Ripon Society as a real force multiplier for uh, things that we care about as Republicans. So it's good to be back here. It's good to be here with Senator Daines. I think he, you know he talked a little bit about this. One of the unfortunate things is <clears throat> um, we tend to get siloed on one side of the Capitol or the other, and and, uh, and so the bill that he talked about, support for Rapid Innovation Act, is a bill that actually I introduced last Congress and we passed it. Um, and then I reintroduced it and it's passed the House. And uh, I was really pleased that uh, that he uh, introduced the companion bill um, over in the Senate. And you know, hopefully this is, uh, particularly given the issue that we're talking about, an area where you can see um, constructive legislation getting to the president's desk and uh, actually signed into law. And I think that's one of the great, uh, while we're facing great challenges with regard to our cybersecurity, I do think that this is an area where um, uh, there's, a, there's a possibility, obviously I'm working with another Republican uh, uh, member and Senator Dane, but I think there's actually a, a great opportunity and continued opportunity for bipartisan support in this space, which is, um, which is very important. So, um, uh, John talked a little bit about my background, and it's it's important because it ties in really what Senator uh, D Daines talked about. You know, his perspective is one as someone coming from the private sector here and bringing sort of that um, that knowledge into the areas and the challenges of cybersecurity that private companies um, have faced. That's not my background. I'm a former terrorism prosecutor. Was the United States Attorney uh, under President Bush, so I bring the other side and really the perspective of, uh, of, of law enforcement. My background, um, uh, I think I may be the only member of Congress that's actually tried a terrorism case and um, that really goes to my core view of uh, federalism and the role of the federal government. I go back to the preamble of the you know, uh, Constitution. The primary role of the federal government is to provide for the common defense. Um, Historically, and until recently, that really, um, the focus there really has been on securing the sovereignty and integrity of our territorial borders, and the focus there, obviously, on our physical borders. And you've seen, you know, candidate Trump become President Trump by focusing on that very issue and talking about, you know, building uh, a wall down on our southern border for, for security. But you know, as the senator said, and as I have lived as, uh, as someone um, uh, from this perspective, I will tell you that um, the greatest challenges, the greatest threats that we face uh, as a nation no longer come across our physical borders, they come across our digital borders. Um, and he, he very accurately referenced the scope and the volume of what that um, entails today, literally to the tune of uh, millions of invasions every day, and Americans are far, far, far uh, more at risk from uh, a digital attack than from someone crossing our uh, physical border, of, uh, crossing the Rio Grande. So um, that's the challenge uh, uh, that we face, and so now you have the merging of you know technology as it ties into our national security. Um, and I very much view, I had the conversation with some of you this morning, we were having breakfast, um, I very much view this now as our greatest national security threat. Um, you know, again, as, a, as, as someone in law enforcement, I can tell you now that um, uh, cybersecurity threats um, have now become the greatest criminal enterprise in the world. It's, it's surpassed drug trafficking as the most profitable criminal enterprise in the world, think about it. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's much easier now um, to uh, conduct and be successful in criminal enterprises that you can do from half a world away uh, in a few seconds and in a few keystrokes. And you can literally impact um, uh, millions of Americans, and every one of us is at risk. And so that really sort of underscores uh, the great challenge um, uh, that we face. And you know, one of the things that drove home that point for me is when I came in, I was fortunate with my, with my background, went to the Homeland Security Committee and uh, Chairman Paul, also a former federal prosecutor, knew my background, gave me the opportunity right out of the gate to chair the Cybersecurity Subcommittee. So even before I got uh, sworn in as a member of Congress, I knew I was going to have a, a gavel of a very important subcommittee uh, on this issue. 
um, which as you know is, is, is pretty rare. Um, but it's funny, in, in my district, which is a, a, a largely a rural north and east Texas, and includes places like Paris and Sulphur Springs and Texarkana, um, folks there didn't really, uh, didn't really mean a whole lot. And so now you, you fast forward to the conversations that I'm having two years later in places like Sulphur Springs and the <coughs> intervening and superseding events that have happened in this space have really changed people's perspective. Um, I was talking to someone in the healthcare industry here uh, when, when a little hospital in Mount Pleasant, Texas um, uh, is victim to a ransomware attack. Uh, it gets people's attention there. And of course, um, everyone in our country has seen now uh, the Russian attempts to influence uh, our election. And so now that's you know dominating the news. And so, so now when I go to Sulphur Springs, they do want to talk about cybersecurity. And, you know, it's both a blessing and a curse. It's those bad events that um, have sort of raised the public conscious and awareness of this issue, um, you know, which is a good thing, but we, we don't always want it to be for the bad reasons that, uh, um, that, that we're seeing about right now. Bottom line is this, as someone, um, again, who, who uh, uh, has spent uh, a good percentage of my, you know, of my life focusing on these issues, you know, America is the world's um, superpower. Increasingly, we all have to come to the realization and understanding that we will only be the world's superpower if we are the world's cyber superpower. Um, those will go hand in hand. Countries around the world cannot compete with the United States with respect to our kinetic firepower. We're always going to have the best ships and the best planes and the best equipment. But now, when those ships and planes and equipment are all connected to the internet and the control systems are connected to the internet, who controls the internet um, is really the one in charge. And that really underscores uh, from a national security uh, perspective um, what that means. And of course that, that ties into our, to our economic security as well. And, um, and from the private sector, as, uh, as the Senator talked about, companies that have spent decades uh, building a specific brand um, and a level of trust with the American consumer to see that change overnight based on um, uh, an event, uh, a hack that uh, is successful and takes, takes place in a very public way. So that's why the legislation uh, that Senator Dane's reference is, is so important that he and I uh, we'll hopefully see that uh, see the president sign that into law later this year because it is designed for that very purpose to 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 allow the United States to be the world's cybersecurity uh, superpower by spurring innovation and uh, modernization of uh, of our federal government to keep speed with the private sector and for the private sector to collaborate and be able to work together to meet the challenges that we're facing we're doing it better than anyone else in the world um, uh, and by specifically enhancing uh, the role of the Department of Homeland Security to be able to secure not just our federal networks and uh, uh, OPM type uh, breaches but also to be able to protect our critical infrastructure, which 85% of which is in is in private hands, not in not in uh, control of the government. Um, the good news here, one of the one of the things that I'm excited about is that the new administration very much is in line with with this thinking. So I was invited. Uh, good news is I was invited Monday. I was one of I think four or five members of Congress invited to the White House for the American Technology Council. Um, uh, and the new innovation, American Innovation Office over there, which is focused on transforming and uh, modernizing the, the federal government. Um, the bad news is, because of uh, travel and uh, uh, weather and other things, I, I wasn't able to be there um, and make it to the event in time. But one of the things that was important uh, of, of many of the topics that they talked about was um, purchasing and contract reform with respect to the federal government, which is I know, uh, one of the challenges that some of the folks in this room have, um, have experienced. Modernizing our IT acquisition um, and leveraging private sector um, innovation is really, it's, it's going to be essential to um, uh, our federal government's uh, cybersecurity uh, posture going forward. And so one of the things 
that Senator Daines mentioned that are, is probably most important that our bill will do is extend something called uh, OTA, Other Transactional Authority. And, and really what it, it does is um, uh, it allows the federal government to more easily work with and to contract with non-traditional government partners, um, startups, um, and uh, small ventures that uh, typically wouldn't uh, and traditionally haven't been uh, partners with providing solutions to the federal government. So what OTAs uh, do is is allow the government to collaborate with with these small startups to work towards providing the solutions that, uh, to some of the needs that the federal government has. So, uh, and this is not hypothetical. So you mentioned uh, Silicon Valley. I was recently out there to see the Department of Homeland Security in action with respect to this program. And there is the Silicon Valley Innovation Program where this is actually in play where, where uh, Homeland Security brought in their partners, the startups that are providing some of the solutions. So for instance, uh, uh, when the federal government knows there are specific needs with respect to, I think one of the companies um, uh, trained and took care of uh, canines at the border and some of the specific challenges that they had in that capacity, um, the federal government um, can work with a startup company to specifically address that need and, and essentially provide a fix to that solution. So there are really good things happening in this space and uh, that uh, we have an opportunity to, to you know, here in Congress to, um, to, you know, to answer the question, how do, we, how do we rise to the challenge? We always have as, uh, as an American people and as an American economy, but, but, but now this is the new challenge that, that we all face and you know, we don't want to you know, approach it from the, you know, the, the, I guess the famous Winston Churchill line that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other possible remedy. You know, we don't want to wait here in this, uh, in this space. Uh, uh, we can't afford to, in this time and with the challenges that we face, the federal government and the, and the private sector collectively. And so uh, uh, this bill will, uh, will go a long way to helping with respect to that. But the other thing, I guess the, the, the important takeaway for everyone here is I wish there was a silver bullet. I wish there was one bill that could come, become a law that would solve this problem. We just all have to adjust and, and adapt to, uh, again, this is the national security threat that we, will, uh, that we will be facing for the remainder of our lives. And so we all have to rise to the challenge. Uh, and I'm optimistic that uh, we'll have the ability to do that. So anyway, I know they want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So. Um, Thank you, Coach. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Pennant, you get uh, first or the last one on this one? Well, I'll do the first, just following up on your closing comments. Uh, do you have a sense from your colleagues across the aisle that they're willing to work with you on this? I mean, everything seems so hyper-partisan out there. Yeah, it, it does. So, like, the, the, the bill, the uh, House version of our bill, um, I think, passed something like, uh, 415 to 7 or something like that. So, I mean, it had uh, overwhelming bipartisan support. And that's where uh, I say that the opportunity here, the good thing about this is as a new challenge and a new threat and increasingly, you know, uh, I mean, one of the challenges here is we talk about raising the, the cyber IQ level and the cyber hygiene level uh, around the country. We have to do it here in Congress as well. And, you know, you know, I had one of the, not, you know, one of the members, um, uh, not to name names, uh, but you know, it's like, oh my God, it's always cyber, cyber, cyber. When we just talk about cyber, <laughs> 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 um, and so, uh, uh, but but the good thing is because of that, because it's relatively new, it hasn't. I'm just going to go ahead and say it, it hasn't really been contaminated by um, uh, partisanship. Yet now, one of the things that concerns me is making the Russian um, attempts to interfere with our election through cyber means making that a partisan issue, and 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 we're 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 starting we're starting to see some contamination on uh, where this issue is being politicized in a way that hasn't been before, and that's dangerous because. It'll, it'll prevent us from having, you know, uh, votes where it, where it will pass, you know, uh, 415 to 7 or whatever it was. 
Um, so, so for right now, there is a recognition that we this is the, the you know the challenge that we face is you know the internet was built for, for for convenience and opportunity was not built for security, and so now we're all trying to retrofit it and patch it uh, for that purpose. And we know that we're essentially behind the curve, and the bad guys you know you know uh, they've got to find one way in, and we've got to protect uh, you know uh, sometimes thousands of. Uh, uh, entry and exit points, if you will, and so it's just it's easier to play um, offense than defense right now. We do a pretty good job, and and so the uh, as the senator said, the the, the um, evidence that things are improving was the the recent WannaCry uh, ransomware. If you look what happened over in Europe versus what happened here, it's a perfect example of you know the Department of Homeland Security doing exactly what it should be doing and coordinating with the private sector to to make the uh, impact of the WannaCry um, uh, ransomware attack here minimal. And so, we, you know, there, there's the good news is that there's evidence that, that we're rising to the challenge. We've got a long way to go, and there, there is no silver, silver bullet. I mean, it's just going to continue because the bad guys are going to continue to find new technologies and ways to exploit, and, and uh, both the federal government and the private sector are going to have uh, increasing challenges in terms of protecting, you know, whether it's personal, you know, uh, information and data, or whether it's the control systems to chemical and, you know, uh, to our critical infrastructure. Um, so, uh, that's how I see it, at least for right now. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, as part of the president's <coughs> initiative, he, uh, they're moving, I think, in the public sector, they want to move more things to the cloud. Is that more or less safe? Is the cloud more or less safe than the way it used to be? <laughs> or the way it is now for many of the agencies? Well, I think what, what the, 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 you know, the, ch the cloud has its challenges as well, and so that actually was one of the, I think there were 10 areas of focus at the, you know, the, this, the, uh, this American Technology Council brought together, you know, Apple, Yahoo, uh, Oracle, um, all the all the big tech names, um, and um, for brainstorming sessions. And one of them was on, you know, on the cloud and cloud computing specifically, I think, and those kinds of things. But you know, increasingly, we you know, uh, we have to look for alternatives to you know perimeter defense um, uh, as 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 the primary means of protecting our. Uh, uh, our data, because as, as we've seen, it that hasn't worked, and that uh, um, uh, so the cloud presents, uh, I think, infinitely more possibilities for better protection. But it has its challenges as well. But again, what you really need is facilitation between the best folks in government and the best best folks in private in the private sector addressing all these issues. So whether it's you know cloud security or encryption challenges or you know. Uh, you know, cross-border data flows. I mean, all all of these things. You know, the good news is that there are solutions. Uh, you know, ultimately there are solutions to all these problems. We just have to um, you know work together to, um, to 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 get them to a place where we can get some consensus about what should be uh, implemented and how, and whether or not there should be the role of government that it plays. Whether or not it should be regulating in certain spaces or mandating or not. Um, and uh, that's you know that's a challenge and a balance as well. Congressman, uh, so uh, our old friend uh, Chelsea uh, is uh, back in the news, and Reality Winner is in the news as government contractors that are for sort of human intelligence sources. What were your thoughts about uh, what could be done there? Well, I'm hoping that uh, um, the it, it's just hard to believe that you know that you know. I mean, my wife is still mad at me. I've never, you know, would tell her anything that I learned from a classified setting. And, you know, it's always like, well, you can tell me. But I was always, you know, uh, I always would say, you know, I love you, but I won't go to prison for you. And, you know, the, 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 the linking classified information is a federal offense. And I was always, as, a, as someone that has had security clearances in the different roles, you know, frankly, paranoid about that. And that's how I think, I think that's how folks that, that have security clearances should be obviously we we have a repetitive challenge with respect to contractors getting clearances and then abusing those clearances and so that's something that um, uh, that that we that we have to address. 
I'm hoping that one of the things that may come out of all of this um, uh, that's going on right now, and you know, uh, with, when I say all of this, uh, everything that has come up with respect to special counsel and the investigation of the Russians and the leaking of information and all that, is I do know that one of the things um, that special counsel Mueller is focused on right now and is concerned about are the leaks um, and has privately told uh, members of Congress that that is something he will get to the bottom of um, and there needs to be real accountability there to, to have a deterrent effect. It's like anything, bad, be bad behavior will, uh, will happen uh, if it's not deterred and this, you know, again, not to get, you know, hyper partisan, but, you know, I, I think the, uh, President Obama sent the exact wrong message with respect to Chelsea Bradley Man Manning, uh, uh, you know, uh, walking out the door and, and uh, um, commuting the remainder of that, uh, that sentence, because I think harsh sentences and um, uh, need to be the consequences to putting America's national security interests out there um, where it's jeopardizing literally uh, sources, methods, and lives uh, of Americans. Oh, Tom. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, Tom. <laughs> the, uh, it seems to me that with individual hackers, you know, you got to have defects. When it comes to something like organized crime on a major scale, or more importantly, government. Uh, focused hacking of uh, major systems in the U.S., let's say the electric grid, that defense is okay, but I'm not sure you want to count on that alone, because they only have to get through once. You can stop right. them a billion times, they get through once, and it's a problem. So how do you think about having an offensive capability, just as we do in, let's say, the nuclear world? Yeah, I, and this is one of the areas, um, I'm actually on a panel a little bit later t uh, this morning, um, to talk about some of some of those same issues. So you know, you raise a couple of points there. One of the things is, you know, sometimes the we talk about criminal enterprises, and you talk about um, uh, nation states and uh, other countries out there. It's hard to tell sometimes where one ends and one begins um, in certain countries. And so, so, so we're seeing that. But but generally, the the issue of of, of responding and being offensive or, or hacking back, if you will. Again, I'm very much of the mindset that there has to be deterrent to bad behavior. Um, the risk is, of course, um, uh, who does it? Uh, you know, there's there's a bill out there about you know giving companies you know uh, the ability to hack back. One of the downsides to that, one of the things that I'm concerned about is uh, things are so sophisticated out there right now that sometimes you think you know who hacked you and you don't in terms from an attribution standpoint. And so if you hack back at someone that's the wrong someone, uh, you can literally create an international incident. Uh, and so uh, we need to be, we need to make sure that when we, that we are responding that we've got the attribution correct. But part of this I think is one of the challenges is right now there are not really international norms that can guide uh, these uh, these bad actions. In other words, here, you know, we're trying to regulate here within our own country, but, but there's no sort of international norms out there that are accepted in terms of, okay, what is actually a, uh, an act of digital war um, to which there is an appropriate proportional response like there would be to an act of war. Um, and so defining those things going forward is, is really, I think, the answer to the question is, and I think that starts with leadership. That's one of the things I'm excited about about this administration and the approach and some of the folks that they've that they brought in. We just didn't we just didn't see it in the last administration. And it really has to start at something you know, like a G7 level where you're starting to have these conversations about about um, uh, some understanding with respect to what these international norms would be to to uh, sort of define when a response is going to be expected and appropriate.